So it is my great honor, and I'm so excited to be able to welcome you today to GSU School of Public Health, and particularly to our Grand Round series. Um, welcome to those of you in person. It's been lovely to see so many amazing faces here, as well as welcome those who are joining us online. So the Georgia State University School of Public Health initiated the Grand Round series as a mechanism to host monthly speakers who are truly leaders in the field. And so I want to make sure before we introduce our speaker that I thank those that make this possible. I want to thank Marcus Cooper, Sam Fami, Jordan Irons, Amanda Norris, and Lillian Morgado, without whom this would not happen. I mean, literally would not happen. Um, I also want to thank the Grand Rounds Committee for being able to help us identify so many fantastic speakers who will be joining us this semester, including uh, Dr. Kramer, who you'll be hearing from today. Um, I look forward to joining or having you join us at future Grand Round sessions, including next month when we will host Dr. Jennifer Hirsch from Columbia University, as well as Dr. Riviero, from, um, who is currently a Fulbright Chair at Emory University. But today, before we get to all of that, it is my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Baguette, the Director of Mark Chapin Center for Healthy Development and an Associate Professor, to give the full and proper introduction of our speaker, Michael Kramer. Kathleen? Good afternoon and welcome. It is my privilege to introduce today Dr. Michael Kramer, Director of the Emory Maternal and Child Health Center of Excellence. I was delighted to learn that Dr. Kramer would be joining us today, and I know that so many of you throughout the School of Public Health and the Mark Chapman Center for Healthy Development share high enthusiasm for his visit, especially those of you in the Maternal and Child Health Certificate Program, the Georgia Association for Infant Mental Health, and the National Safe Care Training and Research Center, as, uh, many, among many others. Dr. Kramer is a highly esteemed social epidemiologist. His research is focused on maternal and child health from a life course perspective. And much of this work is conducted at the intersections of the social determinants of health and spatial analysis in an effort to understand and address macro social determinants of racial and economic disparities in preterm birth and maternal health, including morbidity and mortality. He studies neighborhood <coughs> effects as well as broader regional and sub-national processes, including racial and economic residential segregation. <coughs> His research is funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the March of Dines. He is an innovator in developing data visualization tools to facilitate surveillance, and not just surveillance, but action to eliminate inequities in poor perinatal and maternal health outcomes. And in elucidating geogra geography oppor opportunity for early childhood development, including the measurement and modeling of spatially structured social and physical environments. His presentation today is titled, Changing the Conversation about Maternal Health Equity, History, Diffusion of Progre Progress, and the Social Reproduction of Health. Um, we will, we've reserved some time, about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions, so I'd ask that you hold your questions to the end. And then with that, uh, Dr. Kramer, please accept our warmest welcome today. get my technology working. Does that sound work from here if I move around? Okay, cool. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. It's been such a pleasure to be here today. It's an honor to be invited and I've had just really a wonderful time meeting with some faculty, meeting with some students. It's been, um, it's just been very pleasant. Uh, so I appreciate that. So the title of what I'm talking about today is a bit of a mouthful. Um, changing the conversation about maternal health equity, history, diffusion of progress, and the social reproduction of health. I actually thought I wanted to start telling you a little bit about my professional path because I feel like I've landed at a kind of funny intersection of things and sometimes it's useful to know how people got there. So I uh, got my undergraduate degree in 
an interdisciplinary major that was kind of sociology anthropology in the early 90s. And at that time, I was interested in the idea of providing, extending healthcare access to communities that were underserved. I grew up in uh, the mountains in eastern Kentucky, and I was uh, in influenced in my growing up by sort of the extent of um, concentrated poverty and a lack of resources, but also the resilience of communities. Um, there were also then the overlay of sort of uh, extractive influences in the region and the way they shaped uh, the, the communities there. So I thought when I graduated that maybe what I wanted to do was get an MPH. And at that time, I thought policy was the thing that I was interested in because um, I was interested in extending care. But a friend of mine uh, had entered a, a physician assistant program, and this was in the early 90s, and nurse practitioners and PAs were kind of increasing their prevalence as uh, at filling the gap of um, unmet health care needs, particularly in rural communities. So that was convincing to me. I thought, okay, I have this sort of liberal arts undergrad. I'm really good at thinking. I can't actually do anything. So maybe getting a degree where I could do something would be really great. So I became a PA. Again, interest was still in delivering health care to underserved communities, but instead of kind of going back to the Southern Appalachian Mountains, um, I ended up working for some time at Grady here in Atlanta. I worked at the Ponce Clinic, um, providing essentially primary care services to people with end-stage AIDS. This was right at the um, junction of when highly active antiretroviral therapy began. So at this point in time, AIDS, HIV led to AIDS, and AIDS almost always led to death. And so we were managing care in that stage. Um, just as, as heart was coming in. So that was a great job. There were lots of things I loved about it, but I had this opportunity to go back to a place I'd been uh, as a student uh, on the Navajo Nation in the Southwest. And so I moved west with my family and uh, worked for a tribal hospital, not an Indian health service hospital, but a tribally run hospital um, that was in the middle of the desert, uh, an hour from the nearest grocery store. We provided um, a lot of outpatient services, limited inpatient services, and I was still providing primary care, and it was great. But I burned out after a while. Um, I burned out for a few reasons. One is I realized I'm kind of introverted, and the kind of uh, thing that you need as a clinician is to have 45 intimate relationships a day, and that was exhausting for me. I couldn't do that. Um, in addition, I realized that the thing that I started off envisioning, providing access to care for underserved communities, was really difficult to do in a one-on-one -on -one basis. I, I felt like I was routinely um, putting figurative and literal band-aids on population health problems. I felt like I wasn't working in the part of the problem that I was interested in. Now, I talked to people who are in population health and they wish that they could be applied clinic clinicians because they feel like they want to have kind of more hands-on impact. So I guess the grass is always greener. But for me, I felt like I was providing individual solutions to population problems. Um, at the time, I kind of became introduced to the idea of population research, and so I returned and, and got a PhD in epidemiology. I planned to return to the Southwest and basically work at an institution that would be providing teaching the, the public health workforce for the area. Um, but I had children and a partner and they had opinions and they got embedded here and we didn't move to the Southwest. So instead I stayed here and developed this sort of mix of interests that I'd landed on. Maternal and child health partly because it met this sort of interest in a broad spectrum of health across the life course. Not super like organ specific but really population specific. Um, and then this idea of social epidemiology. I've always been motivated by the way that Health is produced not because of what's under our skin, but because of the ways we organize ourselves. And a lot of that is apparent in spatial patterns, and so I began doing a lot with spatial methods. So maternal and child health, uh, po uh, population health driven by socio-structural processes is kind of where I landed. So maybe that does or maybe that doesn't kind of give context for like what I'm gonna um, share today. Uh, but for me, it feels like a very natural progression of events, and I think it, it, it sometimes is useful to connect why that is. So why do I think maternal and perinatal health are important for public health research? I think they're important for a couple different reasons. I mean, from the point of view of populations, it's hard to deny the fundamental role of reproduction for population health, right? So there's the value of taking care of ourselves at this important life stage. But from the point of view of thinking about social determinants of
I think pregnancy is a really incredible model for understanding the biological embodiment of social experience. It's a, it's a time in our life when we're particularly sensitive to the biological changes that are influenced by social things. And so we can maybe use our, our understanding from studying social patterns in maternal and child health, health outcomes to, to generalize uh, much more broadly. So that's been kind of what drove me here. So let me tell you a little bit about maternal and child health in this country. Um, America doesn't look so great. Um, if we compare ourselves to other countries, for example, on preterm birth, we rank 34th out of 34 high-income countries in terms of our preterm birth rate. If we compare ourselves to other countries on our infant mortality rate, so the rate of babies who die in the first year of life, we rank 33rd out of 35 high-income countries in terms of our infant mortality rate. And maternal mortality, or pregnancy-related mortality, has been in the news a lot in the last few years. And if we compare ourselves to other countries in maternal mortality or pregnancy-related mortality rates, we rank 34th out of 35. So clearly, despite spending an incredible amount on health, as a population, we're not doing exceptionally well. Now, that's comparing ourselves to other parts of the country. But we can look within the US and also see variation. And so, as population health scientists, we, we exploit variation to understand something about possibly causes and possibly opportunities for prevention. So for example, we can see variation by geography. So this is just a map of infant mortality rate by state. We can also see variation or disparities in perinatal and maternal health outcomes by socioeconomic status, for example, by income or by maternal education. And we can also see disparities or variation by race and ethnicity. All of these are important. There are also other social dimensions across which we probably have unjust inequalities, right? So differences between population groups and their health outcomes that are not just due to biologically essential traits, but are due to something uh, that is potentially preventable. Um, that being said, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna use examples that primarily focus on this last one, racial ethnic disparities, because those are salient in the South they are salient with, with respect to um, social and structural determinants of health um, and because they just let us focus in a little bit. So my focus today on racial ethnic disparities is uh, as an example, but we can certainly uh, look at variation across economic class or geography or migration status, et cetera. So let me give you a few numbers about racial disparities and perinatal outcomes. So I'm gonna show a few graphs like this. Um, this is the black-white rate ratio in preterm birth. So 1.6 means that um, babies born to black moms have about a 60% higher risk of preterm birth than babies born to white moms. If we look at low birth weight, low birth weight is a baby that's born less than 2,500 grams. That black-white racial difference is about twofold. If we look at infant mortality, it's about 2.3-fold. If we look at very low birth weight, Babies less than 1,500 grams, this is a smaller group of babies, but at much higher risk of mortality and morbidity. There's almost a three times higher rate of disease or morbidity um, for babies born to black moms as babies born to white moms. And if we look at maternal mortality, so death during pregnancy or following pregnancy as a result of the pregnancy itself, there's between a three and fourfold difference in racial disparities. So what I've just done is a thing that we do a lot in disparity scholarship is we throw a bunch of numbers at you and we kind of assume that the internal conversation, the interpretation of those numbers is shared between what's in my mind and what you hear. But what I would like to suggest today is that the way we talk about health equity is sometimes incomplete or decontextualized. And as a result, we may inadvertently imply to people who are listening, policymakers, stakeholders, community groups, communities who are affected, things that are different from what we understand to be going on. So I would make two arguments today about ways we can change the conversation. I recognize that for many of you who are already working in health equity space, these are things you're thinking about. So I'm not necessarily coming up with novel ideas, but I wanna put them in this particular context. My first uh, sort of case for how we change the conversation with respect to health equity is thinking about well, what do we mean when we say there were threefold, twofold, one and a half fold, 
who's responsible? So can we talk about who or what is responsible? What I mean by that is can we shift from what is the default assumption for a lot of folks, which is that it's an, something about the individual. Biological essentialism, so it's like it's their genes, or individual behaviors or choices, right? So this idea of reductionism, can we shift from reductionism to social production or social determinants of health? So I'm gonna give an example of what I mean by this. I don't know if folks have read um, Jeff Rose, who was a, a, a British epidemiologist, um, is dead now, but was famous for um, some interesting ways of thinking about clinical epidemiology and population health science. And um, his paper, Sick Individuals, Sick Populations, is I think very motivating for how I think about problems. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna adapt an example that he gives in that paper to perinatal health. So what I'm showing you here is a density plot of all the babies born in the US in 2017 by their birth weight. So on the x-axis at the bottom is the birth weight. And the y-axis, how tall this is, is basically like how many babies at that particular birth weight, right? Um, and you'll notice that on the right-hand side of the scale, it's up to five kilos, five kilograms, and on the left-hand, it's down to like a one kilo. Um, and so there's a few babies who are really heavy, a few babies who are really light, and most babies are in the middle. So birth weight is interesting in that it really follows a very nice bell curve. It does the thing that we like numbers to do sometimes. And then I've got this red line up here. That red line is drawn at 2,500 grams. That's the line we make for low birth weight. So if we're researchers and we want to know why is there low birth weight, a common thing we do, risk factor approach, is to ask what's different about babies on the left-hand side of the line as compared to babies on the right-hand side of the line. So we're asking what differs between individual babies. This is like the cause of cases in Rose's terminology. And that's been a very productive approach. We found that things like infections, stress, smoking, and genetics are important. But we've also had a lot of papers that say race is an individual level risk factor for low birth weight. Now, if I were to take the data and stratify by maternal race, again, this is all the births born to non-Hispanic white or non-Hispanic black women in the US in 2017, you would see this plots on the right. So they're the same idea, birth weight on the x-axis, number of babies on the y-axis, or the relative proportion of babies, actually. Um, the first thing you might notice is the shape of the curves is nearly identical. Like, what that means is babies aren't the same, right? Some babies are big, some babies are little, most babies are average. It's true for black babies, it's true for white babies. Individuals are different from one another. So that remains true, but the other thing that's true is you see an entire shift of the birth weight distribution to the left for babies born to black moms compared to white moms. And one consequence of that is you see more babies below the 2,500 gram line. So there's a higher prevalence of, of uh, low birth weight. What I think is important about this shift in asking instead about individual babies to, to looking at, at stratified groups is we change the question from um, why did this baby have low birth weight to why does this group of people have a different experience of low birth weight prevalence as compared to this group? We ask what's different between populations. And when you ask what's different between populations, a different set of factors comes up. Maybe instead of saying race is the individual risk factor, the experience of racism may be shifting the distribution of birth weight. Maybe instead of just saying it's stress or infection, maybe the role of stigma, discrimination, and segregation in producing population differences in stress uh, is having a contributing role, um, or th certainly things like healthcare access. So this idea is simply just understanding that when we're thinking about individual risk, we might look for individual factors, but when we're talking about equity, the difference between groups, probably the default should not be are there genetic reasons why these two groups are different. The default should be what are the social lived experiences that might explain this. I'm not saying that 100% across the board there's never genetic reasons, but if I were to show you the evidence that genetic reasons explain racial disparities and the evidence that social reasons do, there's like virtually no evidence that the genetic reasons explain racial disparities in perinatal outcomes. There, are, there is evidence that genetic reasons explain individual differences. But when we're thinking about group level differences, that's simply not a strong explanatory role. So we took this idea a little bit further. We thought, okay, 
So we can think about variation in uh, risk between individuals, um, recognizing that we live in places and places in code or are embedded with social experiences. I wonder how risk varies across places. So we did a study across 231 cities where in each city we estimated the rate, in this case it's very preterm birth, so a slightly different outcome but correlated, uh, the, the rate of very preterm birth for black women or white women in each city. So here instead of individuals, um, what's on the y-axis is how many cities there are of 231. And then what's on the x-axis is the number of very preterm births per 1,000. So just to give you some idea, um, the highest risk city during the study period for black women was in Lubbock, Texas, and the highest risk city for white women during the study period was Florence, South Carolina. Lowest risk city for black women, San Jose, California, and San Francisco for white women. So there's a couple things that jumped out into this when we made this plot. One is you certainly see the racial disparity, right? There's a black-white difference in the occurrence of very preterm birth. Um, you also see that it's so profound that uh, black women in the quote-unquote best cities have risk about equal to white women in the worst cities. But the thing that I thought was most surprising was the range or the variation, how far apart these are. So in other words, the gap between the best and the worst city for black women was about an additional 35 per 1,000 very preterm births. In contrast, the gap for white women was only 15, so about half as much. One possible thing that means is that for white women, there are differences in risk, but place is not part of this. White women are relatively less sensitive to the role of place. And black women seem to be more sensitive to the role of place, or said another way, the places may have more variability in how healthy or toxic they are. And so this gets us thinking about, well, what is it about place and social experience that's shifting the average risk? I'm gonna go by this just in the interest of time. I can come back to it at some point. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna summarize just briefly a few different bullets of things we've done across a variety of projects. Um, my point is not so much to go into detail on each exposure, but to give kind of an idea of the sorts of things that are place-based that may be social determinants of maternal uh, health outcomes. Um, in Georgia, we found that violent crime rates uh, are associated with both preterm birth and low birth weight, and that neighborhood deprivation, a measure of material resources and wealth at the neighborhood level, is independently associated with both preterm birth and infant mortality, and in both those cases, independent of individual risk factors like uh, maternal age, maternal education, parity, um, pregnancy risk factors, et cetera. Um, I do a lot of work in severe maternal morbidity and maternal mortality, so instead of focusing on the infant as the sort of unit of analysis or the outcome, what we do in preterm birth and low birth weight, thinking about maternal health. So in Georgia, severe maternal morbidity, we found that um, concentrated poverty as measured with the ICE index, index of concentration at extremes, is associated with hypertensive disorders and that racial differences in those hypertensive disorders explain about a quarter of the black-white disparity in SMM in severe maternal morbidity. So hypertension is an important difference that explains some of the severe morbidities and that that's produced at least partly by living in places with uh, high concentrated poverty. And that concentrated poverty also seems to have a direct impact on severe maternal morbidity, and that effect is present for both black and white women, but stronger for black women. And then finally, just a few things about uh, pregnancy-related mortality. This is now not in Georgia, but using a US data set. This is data in collaboration with CDC, um, thinking about the community drivers of race-specific maternal mortality, net of individual risk factors. And we had a whole bunch of them, and just showing a few here. Um, there were some factors like uh, social capital or violent crime rates where the pregnancy-related mortality rate was influenced for both black and white women. So the yellow squares is the rate difference for a one standard deviation unit change um, of, of each of the indicators for white women, and the, the blue triangles is for black women. And so for these two, the effect was present and significant for both black and white women. But there are other times when the exposure seems to have a racialized experience. In other words, the measure in a place is strong for black women and absent for white women. This idea that one might, that two groups of people might experience the same place differently. In this case, this is per percent of households who moved in the past 12 months or percent of households with severe housing problems. 
So what I've done, maybe a little too fast, is I've done this sort of intro to changing the conversation in the terms of moving from uh, reductionism, biological essentialism towards social determinants of health. And I've given just a few um, very superficial examples of how things like violent crime, neighborhood deprivation, concentrated poverty, um, social capital might be factors that are shaping the patterns. But I'd actually like to argue that although what I've done so far is what I do a lot in my work and it is what social epidemiologists do a lot, it's inadequate. And it's inadequate for a number of reasons, and I'll talk about at least one of them. You might think of other ways it's inadequate too, and I'm open to those. Um, but it's inadequate because one of the challenges when we just identify concentrated poverty or uh, neighborhood deprivation as a factor is we haven't really explained how did this come to be? What, why is this? And if we use the sort of words of Nancy Krieger, a social epidemiologist and thought leader in sort of epidemiologic theory and thinking, she says, we've created this web of causation where we can think about all of the factors that are important in producing health, but we're not naming the spider. Who created this web? How did we get here? And one of the challenges that occurs with social determinants of health research is we produce a ton of research that isn't immediately actionable and it isn't uncovering root or fundamental causes. So my second argument for how we can change the conversation is thinking um, when and how are inequities reproduced. So how do we change from what I'm going to call actorless social determinants of health, these metrics of neighborhood things that's, that we treat as if they just were randomly thrown out into the world and not created through systems and history, um, how do we switch from that to structural drivers of health? So this is a figure, I recognize that it's, um, you, you can't uh, read all of the detail, but this is a figure that was in a paper um, on uh, history, racism, and sexual and reproductive health, a review of historical and contemporary evidence. Um, and what the authors were suggesting here is that the production of health, and particularly um, production of health differential by race is, is a product of a lot of things that have happened over time. So what we've got is this timeline that ranges over 400 years, um, starting from 1619 through current times. And what each of the lines are under the main line is the layers of various policies, practices that shape, among other things, sexual and reproductive health. And so we can see this pattern of recurrence over time and across generations that is part of the context that brings us to where we are. So to kind of dig into this, I'm gonna um, show an adaptation of a paper we did on heart disease originally, and we've now adapted it to a perinatal outcome, um, examining a, a, a hypothesis called the legacy, legacy of slavery hypothesis. Um, and it started from seeing something like this map. This, somebody shared this with me at some point. Uh, I do lots of spatial things. People send me maps all the time. It's one of my favorite things. And this one landed at a time I was doing work on mapping a variety of health outcomes. And it, the map struck me because it looked like some things I was working on. This is a map that apparently uh, President Lincoln had commissioned by the Census uh, Bureau in 1860. Uh, and it is a map that shows the proportion of people in every county who are enslaved. So it's a slave concentration map. And it's showing how uneven the concentration of slaves was across the South, something that I naively didn't, gra I didn't understand. I kind of thought slavery was sort of ubiquitous across the South, but that it varied over, over space is interesting to me. So this is that exact same data except put in a more modern GIS, and I do that because I wanted to show you the prevalence of very low birth weight, babies born less than 1,500 grams, between 2015 and 2017, so like just a few years ago. So uh, darker colors means higher prevalence, lighter colors means lower prevalence. Let me just go back. This is the proportion of people enslaved in 1860. That's the prevalence of very low birth weight. That's slavery. That's very low birth weight. Clearly, they're not identical. But there's something that seems overlapping or similar. And we're not comparing to people in Vermont or people in Iowa. We're comparing like counties in Mississippi that had a high slave concentration in 1860 and counties in Mississippi that had a low con 
I didn't know exactly what to do with this when I saw this. It was interesting. And so as I think we need to do a lot in public health, I went out of my discipline and looked for what people were doing elsewhere. And what I found in history, sociology, and political science was this burgeoning literature around the legacy of slavery hypothesis. And we use that word, the legacy of slavery, a lot. But this hypothesis is um, specific to the idea that places have a historical dependence on their initial economic foundation, and that that dependence carries forward through time, that a dependence on a slave economy in 1860 didn't just er get erased at the end of the Civil War. So that there may be ways that institutions, structures, cultures, norms in specific places in the South continue to be shaped by that legacy, by that history. So let me just give you kind of a high level summary of the literature. Um, that again is mostly not from public health and then I'll connect it back to our maternal and child health outcome. Because my question is, is there some reason to link this historical context to this contemporary health pattern? Um, if we look at lynchings, which were a form often of sanctioned political violence used for racial control, if we look at the pattern of lynchings distributed across the South, they are highly correlated with the places that had high slave concentration in 1860. So places with low slave concentration in 1860 were much less likely to have lynchings during the 20th century. If we look at disparities, black-white gap in the poverty rate in counties across the South. So there are black-white disparities in poverty rate, but they're not the same everywhere. Some places they're bigger, some places they're smaller. If we look at those disparities, they are strongly correlated in 2000 with the slave concentration in 1860. So there are African American families living in counties with low slave concentration and their poverty rate is more similar to the poverty rate of whites in that place. So it's the difference of having a higher gap or a lower gap in counties with higher versus lower slave concentration in 1860. Um, similarly, there's larger black white disparities in, edu in attained education in the 20th century that's correlated with slave concentration in 1860. Uh, if we look at white families' willingness to send their children to public schools, white families' disinvestment from public schools is strongest in counties with high slave concentration in 1860. And if we look from the political science literature at sort of racialized resentment, feelings, emotions, there's greater white resentment of blacks in counties with, in, in 2006 to 2011, that themselves had high slave concentration in 1860. Okay, so again, that's a high level summary of this idea of the legacy of slavery. So our question was, is there something about that legacy that shapes places, and if it shapes things like economic conditions, uh, educational conditions, uh, school supports, then might it also be influencing the health of people living in those places now? irrespective of whether their ancestors were from those places, right? So I'm not necessarily interested in testing a hypothesis about literal transgenerational trauma, which is a thing, but saying that something about those places, the structures and institutions, persist in a way. So this is kind of the hypothesis. Does slave concentration, the legacy of slavery, affect opportunities, resources, exposures, and power that themselves affect maternal and child health? And the answer was yes, to some degree. Um, so just uh, to give a, an overview of this, this is a model, modeled estimates of county level prevalence of uh, very low birth weight. On the x-axis is the county prevalence of enslaved people in 1860. So on the left is counties in the south that had very low proportions of people who were enslaved. And on the right is counties in the south that had very high proportions. And so now I've got on the y-axis is the very low birth weight per 1,000 live births. For white women, there are differences county to county in very low birth weight. You see a little bit of a curve there, but essentially there's not much a correlation with enslaved population in 1860. For white women, it doesn't seem to matter. But for black women, we see a relatively consistent increasing risk in very low birth weight as you move from their experience living in a county, say in Mississippi, with low history of slave concentration to living in a county with a high history of slave concentration. Now, 
estimating causal effects across 150 years is challenging. And so this is clearly like an exploratory and explanatory model, but not a final causal answer. But what it begins to do is it locates that pattern of do we see uh, wh what, what might explain these differences in risk we see across space, and not just leave it at some unnamed thing, but beginning to name what might be the processes at play. And when we begin to name what might be the processes at play, we've got maybe more leeway to think about, okay, well, what sorts of interventions would be necessary? Now, I presented this in a number of settings, and, and actually, just last year, a student um, said, you know, this is sobering and entirely disempowering. And that certainly isn't my goal. Um, and so thinking about the role of history as a predictor of current health is challenging. Thinking about the role of structural racism as a predictor of health is challenging because we feel paralyzed by it, because we feel like we don't know what to do about it. So I don't feel like we need to be paralyzed. I want to give you a second story or example about history that I think helps give us some ideas as public health professionals about what we need to do. This is a story about infant mortality. Again, um, thinking about black-white differences in infant mortality. So this is a plot of the infant mortality in the 20th century um, from 1900 through 2000. And what you see from this is the United States made incredible progress in reducing infant mortality, right? Infant mortality went down a lot. And it went down for things that public health had a big hand in, like uh, improved clean water and adequate nutrition, like vaccine and infection control, access to safe labor and delivery, and medical technology and care. Right? So we, ha we made a lot of progress, and that's a really great thing. Now, if we were to take those two lines and make them into disparity measures, we could choose one of two disparity measures. If you're like a quantitative person, you know we sometimes do absolute measures or relative measures. So the sort of yellow line is the black-white rate difference. This is like the subtract the white difference from the black difference. How far apart are they? And if you look at that line, you would say, whew, we're doing great because we have almost eliminated racial disparities in infant mortality. The other line is on the right-hand y-axis, and that's the rate ratio. And so you might say, well, which one should I pick? But the rate ratio is saying, essentially, at every step along the way, as the rate went down, it always went down faster for white babies than it did for black babies. So they always stayed about twofold apart. In fact, I think just mathematically, it's fascinating that um, if you look at the scale on the right, the black-white rate ratio in infant mortality has been about two for almost 100 years which is kind of incredible given the changes in the underlying causes of mortality. So that's what I want to talk about, the underlying causes of mortality. We thought about this idea, like what explains the persistence, the reproduction of inequality in infant mortality, even as we introduced all these great new innovations, like clean water and medical care. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you three plots that look a little bit like this. Again, to orient you, time is on the x-axis. So from 1920 through 1990 or 2000. On the y-axis now, what I'm showing you is the black-white rate ratio. So these aren't rates, this is the, the racial disparity. So if you look at this, you can see that the racial disparity started low, and then it got higher mid-century, and then it went down again. That's what this is showing. What is this? This is infant deaths from gastrointestinal disease. That's basically diarrhea. Babies who died from dehydration related to diarrhea. All right. So in the beginning of the century, black babies and white babies died from diarrhea at about the same rates. So again, this isn't rates. This isn't saying there was a low rate. There was actually a really high rate. It was high for black and white babies. It was similar, okay? But something happened in the middle part of the century where black babies were dying from diarrhea way more, like up to sevenfold more frequently than white babies. Well, if you look at the patterns, and people have sort of unpacked this across the US of how clean water rolled out, it didn't just like suddenly become available to everybody. And if you were to guess who did it become available to first, you would probably be right if you guessed that it became available to people with money and power. And so it became available to white communities and high income communities. What that would mean for a rate ratio is white babies' death from infant mortality went down as they had increased access to clean water. Black babies' infant mortality from diarrhea just didn't change. And as white babies went down, it made the relative gap bigger and bigger. But of course, we have clean water almost everywhere now. So eventually, progress diffused 
to those communities. And so we see this decline in the racial disparity in the latter part of the century. So people caught up, it just took some time. All right, so that's uh, diarrhea as a cause of death and water. We looked at another cause of death, infant mortality attributable to prematurity. So being born too early. Interesting, uh, similar pattern, right? We see in the beginning of the century that white babies and black babies who died from prematurity uh, did so at about the same rate, so that there isn't much racial disparity in death from prematurity. But somehow in the 70s, 80s, 90s, the racial disparity attributable to prematurity increased dramatically and then seems to be decre decreasing. So what happened in there? Well, we had a new invention. It was called the NICU, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, which was a highly technological form of medical care that enhanced the survival of very little babies. So it lets you deliver preterm and not die. So death due to prematurity for babies who had access to a NICU declined dramatically as NICUs became more popular. And if you had a premature baby and didn't have access to the NICU, the death rate would have been the same. So again, um, on average, uh, access to NICUs was uh, earlier and more profound for white families and high income families, and then over time became broadly available. So at this point in time, we would say almost all babies would have access to a NICU. The last example is not quite as profound, but it suggests a slightly different kind of, of new technology. This is death from SIDS. Uh, so SIDS, of course, didn't even have an ICD code until 1980, so that's why the line starts later. And we see this little blip that sort of mimics the previous two. It's not nearly as strong, as I said, um, where we do have a racial disparity in death due to SIDS. And uh, if we look here, one possible explanation is the very first sort of public health messaging to prevent SIDS was the Back to Sleep campaign. And if you were involved in that, in the early days, there was a communications problem. And the communications problem was, we did a great job messaging white middle class moms. And we didn't do a great job messaging everybody else. So again, the technology, instead of being clean water or fancy NICUs, the technology was knowledge, but it wasn't diffused in an equal way, and it therefore exacerbated this disparity, at least for a period of time until there was a correction. So what I'm showing here is an example of what Lincoln Fellin have called fundamental cause theory. The idea that uh, racial or economic or geographic disparities don't exist just for one reason. They exist because of access to resources. The resources that are needed for us to be healthy. And you could, it's like whack-a-mole. You could fix one thing, but if you haven't fixed the resource problem, the, the, the power problem, then the next thing that comes along is just going to be the same. We're going to have unequal diffusion of um, you know, new genetic screens, of access to vaccinations, of the ability to stay home during a pandemic, things like that. So when I think back to that student who said, this is sobering and it's disempowering, I have to think, OK, what are the messages that we get from public health about history? Like, How do we not feel disempowered uh, by connecting current health to historical things. I think one is thinking about this diffusion of progress. If we're the people who are producing new innovation, we need to produce innovation, but we also need to think about implementation. And we need to think about equitable implementation. So if we're developing a new COVID vaccine or thinking about a new stay-at-home policy or thinking about a new screening process for PrEP or distribution process, you know, whatever we're thinking about is the innovation, are we thinking about how it's going to be equitably distributed? If we're not, it's almost inevitably going to reproduce the underlying disparity. It could be everybody goes down, but somebody's going to go down faster, and that group isn't just randomly chosen. Um, so that's one piece, the diffusion of, pro of, of progress. And then the other piece is thinking about health in all policies, thinking about um, the production of health coming not just from health care, medical care, and not just from our public health departments, although health care and our public health departments are both really important, but also coming from criminal justice, coming from housing, coming from economic policy. And so are we doing it an adequate job of being in the room when conversations are being held about zoning in Atlanta, about affordable housing in Atlanta, and the health consequences of that, for example? All right, just a few more thoughts. Again, I've been reflecting on this idea of um, what do you do about this, basically what this, what this student said to me. I feel disempowered. And 
and feeling how to, be, how to have agency, how to feel empowered in the face while also saying we need to tackle structural problems, which are by the very definition of being structural, not easy to change. I do this activity in um, a course I'm teaching where you've probably done this in classes as well or in other activities where there's a series of statements and people stand up and they move to one side of the room or the other depending on their stance. And so one of them I ask is, um, you know, would you, do you feel like epidemiology or public health would be most impactful or do you feel like you would like to be in a job that focuses on what is modifiable and actionable on one hand or focus on root or fundamental causes on the other hand? And this tension between I want to fix things that policy can fix right now versus maybe what policy is fixing right now is just reproducing the fundamental problem and where do we find ourselves? And I think we're mostly pragmatic people and we, we want to find ourselves in a place of doing useful action. And so I struggle with this where I am on this spectrum as well. And I think about the, the kinds of hats or roles public health plays in a society. So we could think that maybe who, what you would want to be is a scientist. You're uncovering patterns and developing some kind of actionable knowledge. But maybe what you want to be is a technologist. Like, you're not developing new knowledge, but you're manipulating and engineering existing knowledge to improve outcomes. So maybe we know what we need to know. We just need somebody to make it work, right? Well, maybe we're technocrats. I sometimes feel like a technocrat, administering and managing the structures of public health for optimal outcomes. Or maybe you're really drawn by being an advocate, right? So taking a side and making an argument for a preferred kind of action for change. Probably all of us have some portion of all of these things, but I think people find themselves in different places, and I think it speaks to that idea of do you find the sort of passion for your work and the impact of your work um, working kind of within systems? Do you find that working outside of, you know, at least some of the institutions? Um, or do you find some way that you bridge across that? And I don't know where you are. I often don't know where I am either. I feel like what I want to be is a scientist and an advocate, and I feel like in practice I'm a technologist and a technocrat. Um, but, okay, so just a couple final thoughts to summarize what I've talked about today. Um, the status of equity in maternal and child health outcomes is a barometer for the entire society. I feel like uh, you don't all have to become interested in maternal and child health, but I think MCH becomes an indicator that's very potent for understanding other things. If we're failing mothers, infants, and families, then we're probably failing in other ways too. So, or if we're succeeding in the health of mothers, infants, and families, then hopefully we're succeeding in other places. So I think it's a useful indicator and, and a useful frame for thinking about health equity and, and the biological embodiment of social experience. Um, in terms of changing the conversation, I think two things I've touched on today. One is to reset our default thinking. And again, I'm not saying it's all your all's default thinking, because again, if you're working in the health equity space, you're probably already thinking about social determinants of health and not just individual level factors. But resetting the default thinking that if you want to know why individual people are different from one another, then study individual people. But if you want to understand why groups have different experiences, then you need to think about what is different about the lived life of those groups. Now, of course, we're not all homogenous in a group. There's variability. We're not all one group. Um, we're not all identical. But this idea of thinking about um, health equity as something that is not just contrasting individual experiences. And then finally, all of us, me included, need to think about when we're producing knowledge, research, studies, evidence that uses social determinants of health but doesn't provide any guidance or context as to how they came to be, then we're probably missing an opportunity to understand the production of them. If we're interested in the food environment and the presence or absence of food, it could be that just plopping a Kroger down in every neighborhood without a Kroger would help. But if the underlying process of the food environment is not just about the absence of the Kroger, but about a whole series of cultural and experiential things around food and food scarcity and access, then plopping a Kroger down by itself is probably not going to be adequate. So thinking about how our individual decontextualized social determinants of health are part of some sort of a structural or historical process. And that's all I got for you. So I am 
pleased to be here again, and I'm happy to have more conversation. Thank you all. Happy to answer questions if there are any. Yes. I'd like to know what your first answer was to the student who said they felt disempowered. Yeah, so I stopped the lecture and sat down and we talked a little bit about it. I, you know, so this idea of the diffusion of progress I felt like was a call to action for public health. But I think in that case I had emphasized, I'd overemphasized the history and de-emphasized the fact that there were opportunities at every step along the way for public health or for people to change the legacy of slavery. You know, thinking about how our institutions work in places, thinking about how information is shared and available, thinking about how healthcare services are available and accessible. So I think the lesson from the legacy of slavery kind of idea, metaphor, analogy is guiding us about missed opportunities. So the first thing I said to him, first we, under, we understood what kind of was the problem and then I think the feeling, I think it, people want things that they can fix now and, and it's hard, I, I feel like health equity isn't something we're fixing now but we need to do a lot more work to be fixing it. And if we just keep kind of pretending like a brochure that provides health behavioral ed education about hypertension control will eliminate the racial disparity in hypertension, like that's clearly not enough. Um, and just having an FQHC in the community is probably a step in the right direction, but not enough. Like, I feel like we need to think about systems that have been produced over time and that need work over time. Thank you so much. This was, I was surprised how relevant the talk was for me. I thought, you know, I don't know anything maternal and child health related, but bringing in the social determinants of health and explaining how they're really not that meaningful without a context was like really strike chord. Um, my question is, in situations with other health problems where you don't necessarily have the racial gap, mm -hmm. so for example, for smoking, mm -hmm. it's not so much uh, delimited along the racial lines, but more along socioeconomic, mm -hmm. so like smoking is concentrated in people who are poor and uneducated. Um, what would be the hypothesis maybe for that, similar to like legacy of slavery? What would you look for mm -hmm. in that case? Well, smoking is interesting. So first, let me just say, I'm not an expert in smoking. So if I say things that are, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna summarize some things that I've gleaned, and I might say things that are wrong, and you can correct me. Um, it, the patterns of who smokes has changed a lot, right? So when smoking first started, it wasn't like low income, right? So what that means is, Smoking as a behavior is socially produced and it's produced through what is sort of valued and maybe uh, through uh, marketing. So I would say kind of an underlying thing for what we see about smoking today is about our relationship to kind of capitalism or marketing or the idea of how a product um, can be sold for a profit even if it hurts people. And so choosing marketing strategies that target certain communities or uh, having uh, marketing that is, um, or shops that are only located in certain communities is an example. Those things don't happen by accident, right? They happen as tobacco companies are navigating kind of a regulatory environment and trying to figure out how to optimize profit. So I think, I think there are structural things that play a role in class-based differences, in geographic differences, in race-based differences. Um, and in that case, I think, you know, tobacco manufacturers are not neutral players, right? And, and so I think thinking, recognizing that they're not neutral players and that their purpose is optimizing profit um, is a lens through which we can approach um, class differences, socioeconomic differences in, in tobacco smoking. A, a, a corollary of that is, you know, we do want to provide, I, I don't want to, when I say structural and social determinants of health and de-emphasize individual, I don't want to say that we shouldn't provide information, knowledge, assist individuals. Like, people are different from one another and people need all kinds of things and they may need smoking cessation programs and whatnot. 
But if we think that the solution to socioeconomic differences in smoking is individual education, then we've stepped out of even entertaining the role of the structure that changed smoking from being something that mostly wealthy white men did to something that mostly low-income people do, right? It, 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 the, the smoking itself was never inherently class. What, it's not like poor people have a gene for smoking, right? It was produced, and it was produced with intent, and the intent was optimizing profit for a company, which is how we organize lots of things. I'll echo everyone else's thanks for uh, a terrific presentation. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that we both started out in primary care uh, ah, yeah. and, and decided that trying to fix populations one at a time didn't really work. Um, although I'm more comfortable talking than you are, uh, <laughs> although it wouldn't show by what's on the stage, so I went into policy and advocacy. Yeah, and, and so uh, really appreciate the attention to context and, and to more of a health and all policies approach. The, the question I have is, um, across the country there's interest, uh, in air quotes, about the problem of maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. um, Georgia being uh, a negative outlier in that, as with so many things. Uh, and, and the focus continues to be primarily on health care, mm -hmm. right? It's around health care access, it's around uh, packs to allow them in settings to respond uh, promptly, um, and not in those broader um, place-based uh, and structural determinants that, based on your important work, is, is really driving the largest part of the problem, I would say. Um, so where are the opportunities for us in public health to change that conversation in a meaningful way that kind of broadens the things that those uh, those state health departments and others focus on as they try to address the problem. Thank you so much for that question. It's a great opportunity to give a shameless plug for a paper um, that actually this, this phrase, changing the conversation, was from a paper that we published in um, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology arguing that for maternal mortality specifically, we needed to think about community drivers. And I am, and I'm, I'm so indebted to the forethought of folks at Division of Reproductive Health at CDC to recognize that as well, and they're actually funding us. And so we're, we're developing this project called the Community Vital Signs Project, which is a tool for providing community context to committees that are called maternal mortality review committees. So I was like, the, I was the co-chair for Georgia's MMRC for about two years, and now work with MMRCs across the country. And the idea is to provide training about kind of the theory and evidence of community social drivers of maternal mortality, but also to provide customized visualizations, dashboards, of each woman's case, where she lived, what was the community context, what was the access to healthcare, what was the um, housing instability, what was the level of segregation, with the idea that those committees who were doing these deep dive reviews of every maternal death in their state would, instead of focusing only on the clinical factors, which is typically what they've been doing, begin to focus on social and community factors as well as facilitators or barriers. So rather than saying she didn't come to her postpartum appointment and then she died from um, a hypertensive emergency, maybe understanding that she didn't come to her postpartum appointment because um, there's no leave postpartum from her job, she doesn't have childcare, she doesn't have transportation, she's got three other kids at home. And these are all potentially modifiable features about the community environment. So that's at early stages, but we actually um, we, we, we piloted that project in Illinois and North Carolina, and we're now in a um, stage of national implementation. So state MMRCs are beginning this, and they're excited, but I'll tell you, it is really hard to go into these committees that have been doing very biomedical reviews and try to get them comfortable thinking about what these social measures mean. One of the goals of the committees is to come up with contributing factors to the death and then recommendations, and they have a really hard time, like they're really good at saying um, she should have gotten a transfusion earlier or she needed an echo in the second tr trimester. They're not so good at saying, you know, uh, Medicaid expansion beyond this point and uh, a, a, a Medicaid rideshare program for your postpartum appointment, like having really specific policy-driven um, recommendations. So that's what, that's what we're aiming for, is exactly what you just said, trying to get them 
to engage with this broader idea. And I tell you, there is a lot of interest. I think most of the committees feel like they want to be talking about it, including Georgia's committee, feel like they want to be engaging. They just don't quite know how. And so we're hopefully providing some of the tools for that. There's lots of other, the National Birth Equity Coalition, Black Mamas Matter, there's lots of uh, Sister Song, there's lots of organizations that are also doing work that's actually engaged with um, MMRC. So we're not the only ones by any means. Yeah, that's great. Looks like we are out of time. I oh, no. uh, wanna thank uh, Dr. Michael Kramer for joining us today for a truly fantastic talk. I know that those in the room enjoyed it as well as those online. Um, so just thank you so much for joining us and for those here and online, we look forward to seeing you on February 13th for our next Grand Rounds, which again is featuring Dr. Jennifer Hirsch. Thank you all.